Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lecture 5, Programming Paradigm CSN. Woo! Um, I do have uh, technology in the news is very interesting. The dilemma of being a cyborg. So there was this New York Times blog posty thing in which it talked about, the author, uh, talked about how one of their friends had just lost all of their hard drives. You know, lost the main hard drive they had for their computer. On it was pictures of their kid like unrecoverable data. And the issue was being a cyborg, which is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conundrum that our generation is facing that last generations didn't face, right? If you look at the little images, the last generation was boxes, of, like my grandmother and my mom both have boxes of books and papers and things. What do we have? We have hard drives and files and folders and finding them in the olden days in the traditional analog way is equivalent to us trying to do a search and not being able to find them in the new way. You know, I knew I had a date. I've had this, my, I, I took a picture of one of my group of students, you know, in 2000, uh, in 19, yeah, no, 2002. Okay, just stay with me. This is a good story. Uh, 2002, I took a picture of my students, okay? I didn't name anything. I called it image dot, you know, image 003 dot JPEG, right? But because I never labeled it at all, I have no idea where that picture is. I have 18 million pictures called image 3jpeg I don't know what the exact name is, and I can't find it. So it's on my hard drive amongst the 7 billion photographs. I'm a photographer, so I have to take like a billion photographs. I don't know where it is, but it's there somewhere because I saw it once when I was doing a search. But then I lost it and I can't get it back. So the point is, this is like my grandmother, you know, where is that receipt that I gave to Costco 19 years ago? It's in, it's in here somewhere. And that's the same issue. Um, her whole bookshelf doesn't get deleted. I guess there are fires. I guess there are fires, right? So the same thing happens then. For me, I just grab my computer and run away. But think about your backup strategy. My whole summary of this is to, I told you that story to tell you this one, which is think about your backup strategy. If you aren't backing up to the cloud and to hard drives outside of your room, then you might be in trouble. Oh, I back up to a hard drive right there. Yeah, what if there's a fire and you lose the whole thing in your house? I mean, hopefully not ever, right, for anybody. But what if it happens? You gotta have a strategy where your data is safe far away, especially if they have pictures or anything that's really important to you for your life, okay? If I have kids, I gotta have that stuff backed up 19 different ways, okay? So that's the, that, today we're talking about, that's the technology news for today. Okay, so we're talking about programming paradigms. There are four big programming paradigms we're gonna be talking about today. They are listed here. Most, by the way, most languages you're gonna be working with are hybrids, so they're not just one pure of these, not just one of these, that purely one of these, but it's a combination of two or three or maybe even four. So the four primary ones are functional paradigm, a procedural or sequential or imperative paradigm. We'll see all these in the next, uh, next lecture, I mean, in the next couple of slides. Um, the object-oriented or OOP paradigm and the declarative paradigm, okay? We're going to talk about Turing completeness, completeness and we'll have a summary. So... You say, that's nice, Dan, that there are four of these things, but what are, they, what are they? What even is a programming paradigm? Simply said, a programming paradigm is, I, don't want, I never read the slides, but simply said, a programming paradigm is the way you interact when you're programming with a system. It is the way you store variables, the way you have control flow, the way you um, store any data, recover data. That's the programming paradigm. And we're going to see four, then you'll see, oh, I get it now. These are four big different ways to do that. Okay, so it's the way you interact when you're programming a computer. It's the style of programming. All right, so that clicker question, that, that survey I just gave you, was to kind of sense of what can BYOB be. And the answer is most languages are hybrids, and BYOB can wear a functional hat. BYOB can wear a sequential hat. BYOB can wear an OOP hat as well as a declarative hat. It's really cool. Um, they call, these are often called the multi-paradigm languages. And this is interesting. If I ask you what is BYOB, it's like giving somebody a fruit juice drink where, in which they have pear and grape and apple. You, you say, oh, I want mango. It turns out mango is like 5%. It's always sweetened with apple juice and, and pear juice and all those things to like bring it in. Go buy like a mango tango. It says, mango tango. It's like mango is like 5%. It's, I just, I'm, just, I'm going, I'm going you know, rogue on this annoyance of like it should be all mango. But no, it's just right. So my languages are like that in which I, I, I forgot the language. I downloaded it. It said it was, was going to be mostly functional, but it's everything. And you know, maybe there's some percentage of functional part, but it can also do other things. Very much like the fruit drink. So this is a review. I did a, this is, I've done this a couple times where I show you a review slide. This is functional programming. The idea is you're just cascading values. You pour values into the top. 
They cascade down and you compose the functions together, new word compose, composition of functions, until you have one answer coming down. If the inputs are the same, the outputs are always the same. That's what a function is. That's why the random one wasn't a function we saw. So no state, no mutation, no side effects, and same input, same output guaranteed. That's a function, okay? And the examples are scheme and scratch and BYOB. If you just do this, you can build functions and always do that as long as you don't have any of the things I say you can't have. They can both be uh, a functional language. It's a review. So here's an example here of this function having sub-functions inside of it and calculating this interesting equation x plus 3 times square of x. Imperative or sequential uh, programming is a really common way for many people to think of things. If you ever did a recipe, which is why I have this wonderful uh, clip art here. If you ever do a recipe, the recipe says, first chop the potatoes, and then add some, so, so, some salt. And then mix them around into a dry rub. And now bake for five, and then test. It's a sequence of steps. That's what imperative programming is like. And if you've ever done that kind of programming before, probably you don't need to be a CS10, because CS10 is about non-majors, non-people, majors, non-majors haven't programmed before. Again, we welcome you if you've done a little bit of programming. If you've done a lot, you should be at the next class, six, CS621A or 9H. But we're talking about imperative programming, sequence of steps. You are allowed to have mutation. In fact, that's usually what happens in the programming world. Set A equals 1. Set A equals B plus 7. Set B equal, set C equals B plus A times C. So you're doing a sequence of things where you're kind of composing it together. Um, here's an example. So assignment allowed and mutation or changing. Mutation is meaning changing the value of a variable is allowed. Here's this function f of x. From last slide, it was x plus 3 times square root of x. How would you do that in a sequential way? Well, let's have an answer variable. Make up a new one. I can do mutation. So make an answer variable. Set it equal to x. Then answer equals square root of answer. What is answer holding now? Square root of x. Right? So that's my square root of x, which I have on the right side of that expression. Now answer equals x plus 3 times answer. And now return answer. See, I broke up that one expression which used to be you know, this composition of all these things that just happens kind of simultaneously into a steps. Do, 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 do. This, I don't have this on the slide, is hard to debug. If you operate in this manner, if you think of this kind of programming, you are going to have a hard time debugging. Why? Because the third, the, the, right in the middle, the guy below answer equals square root of answer, what you have is you have to have a memory, you have to have kind of a picture in your head, maybe on paper as you're working this out. Okay, what is the value of x in answer right now at this stage? And then, okay, now I'm changing it, which means I erase this value, write a new value for answer, and it's like you have to keep track of all the things. In functional programming, you don't do that. There's no keeping track of anything. You just, things just flow and flow and values just fall out and they go to the next, they, go, they pull out like water pulling out and like a waterfall and they go to the next function and they pull it together, do some comp computation and they go to the next function. So in some sense, we think, we, we as the CS folks on, on the team and the teaching staff, believe that this is a harder way to think, which is why the first course for majors here at Berkeley was always a functional course, because it's a lot easier to debug and build big projects if you think in a functional way. Remember, BYOB can be both of these. It can also be this one. And this one is object-oriented programming, or OOP. Now. This is a very, very popular new way of programming. It's a very new, recent paradigm. It's one of the more recent paradigms of the four. And it has really grown in popularity in terms of the big languages people are using now. They're really building big pieces of software using the OOP paradigm. If you've heard of, at the bottom line, Java or C++, a massive amount of code is being built right now by the Googles and the Amazons and the Microsofts and the, of the world in languages like that that are very OOP related. And the reason for that is very clear. It's easy to build a massive project if you think in the OOP way. So if you're just beginning to program, like the people taking the AP exam in high school, that's too, I think, this is Dan going off, again, rogue, wearing my hat thinking, I think that Java, which is the language they use for the AP, is too hard for first time people to programming in high school. I think you should start earlier, and so does the college board. And so they're actually having a new AP that's going to be in front of this AP, 
not as a full prerequisite, like you have to take it, but if it's available in your high school, you can take two of them. And this one's going to be mostly CS10. CS10 ideas, computing in the context of society and law and medicine and art and all those things, as well as programming part of it, but it's not the dominant factor, not the dominant piece that the current AP is. So they also realize that that's broken in that sense. They're going to put a better course in front of it to really grab students, just like you guys are taking the CS10. So you have these two things. Why is it easy to build big programs? Well, the first thing is each, um, the world belongs to factories and objects, okay? So I have a factory, which might make, uh, in my example here, I talk about uh, musicians. A factory makes musicians. And you just crank it, oh, new musician. And you can give it a name, and there's a musician. Go have, and you just crank it again, oh, a new musician. Each musician is an object. The factory, we call the class. It's kind of the, the thing that makes these objects, okay? Each of these objects we call, also call an instance. That's a particular instance of a musician. The, guy, this, the, second one, the first one and the second one, these are two instances of the kind of musician that we create. We might give names to them. We might give them the particular instrument they play. We might say how much money they've made on the tour. Do they have posters? Do they have CDs out? All those things, here's the cool thing, get stored inside the object. Rather than stored somewhere else, oh, here's a table of all the... Musicians and what they've, what they've, what they've, what CDs they put out, and some other table external. No, each object has all this information local to it, which is really powerful. That's called local state. It knows about itself. Each object also knows how to do things that only that object knows how to do. So, for example, a musician would have what we call a method, a, a an action you can ask it to do. And for a musician, what would that be? Maybe. Play an instrument, right? That a normal other object, like a TA, may not have any idea how to do that. I certainly don't know how to play an instrument. I can kind of play it badly, but not really. But play it well. How about play an instrument well? That could be a nice thing that a musician could certainly do that I can't do. Okay? So objects have two things. They have information about themselves, and they also know what they can do to themselves, what they can do. Okay? And you can request things. Now, how do you actually, how does the program actually work? You build all these objects up. And then you have them send messages to each other. So you might have, like, imagine a simulation of a concert where I crank together and I make a conductor object. The conductor object would send a message to all the musicians all at once and say, begin playing. They would then, that, was a me me that message was to their particular method, which is how to play well. Oh, I got a message to do that one. Okay, I will do it now. I'm, I'm a musician. I know how to do this. Ready, go. And it will do its work. Play its music until it's done. So that's, it, might take, it might take information. Play this particular piece might be the information you pass to it in the message. You don't just say play, but play this song. So they'll just all randomly play a different song. So the idea is objects have attributes, which I said like the things that it knows about itself, and behaviors, and the way they interact is via messages. It's pretty powerful. And because of this encapsulation, because of the fact that the musician knows only about itself, the factory really set it up that way with all the, in, you know, the, the initial state it gave it. But it means that all the code to do these things is not floating around, but it's floating only within that class, with that, that particular instance. So that's really powerful. The other thing that's really powerful is we hate, we as computer scientists hate to have copies of things. And so here's, another, here's an example. Now I have a pianist. That is a special case of a musician. And that musician is a special case of a performer. A comedian is a performer, but not a musician. So there are common things, common behaviors and attributes to a performer, like an agent, say. So everyone as a performer has an agent. Okay? Well, that means, how about a musician? It's a special case of a performer. Do I have to write the code about agent? You know, how to pay the agent? How to find an agent? How to do that? No. I can, watch this, just like you get from your parents, inherit. I can inherit from the parent class. You have this tree that says up top is performer. Below that, kind of the child of that, is musician. Below that might be pianist. And so you have this kind of connection where the parent might know how to do things. Like a performer might know how to get an agent, find an agent, do that stuff. Because the musician is a subclass, we call it of a kind of a child of that, 
it doesn't have to repeat that code again. It can say, I don't know how to do it, but my parent does. Because I'm a special case of a performer, therefore I, don't, I need to do nothing in my code about performer stuff because I'll let my parent class handle that. All I need to do is handle things about specifically being a musician and how that's different than being a performer. Similar to be a pianist. How does a pianist differ from being a musician? Well, maybe how far your fingers can reach on the 88 keys or something. I don't know. Whatever pianist, whatever, being a pianist is different than being a musician, right? What kind of a tux? You have to have a tux, I guess, when you right? They always have, so what size your tux is or something. I don't know. Whatever. But the point is... Their special case, and their code only has to do with the things that are special about being a pianist that are different from a musician because you can inherit all that other stuff from your parent. Kind of complicated, but really powerful as you grow to really, really big systems. Okay? So, examples are Java and C++. I'm going to now show you an incredible uh, video, which is Sketchpad. And Sketchpad is the PhD thesis project of Dr. Ivan Sutherland, who was, and this is important for you, the father of computer graphics. It's, uh, you just circle, it's on this slide, right? Father of computer graphics. As we go through this, you're going to be introduced to people who have made computer science and computing important. This is a name you should know, this is a face you should know. So you may see, I, I reserve the right to give you an exam with that face, and who is this? And oh, I got to so it's a little bit. Make sure you know these things, right? If I'm in art class and I show you a beautiful piece of art, a Magritte art, a big, you know, big pipe. You gotta know that's Magritte's pipe, okay? So similarly, this is uh, Dr. Ivan Sutherland, and he's retired. He fundamentally changed. He was, you know, founded Computer Graphics, founded a big company, Ivan Sutherland. He was amazing. Done incredible things. His thesis was possibly the most impressive piece of software ever written. That, does, that, that is not a very light sentence. That, that is the opinion of many, many, many people, that his thesis at the time for what it did was the most impressive piece of software ever. Piece of soft, pieces of software now control you know, massive financial systems and can search the in, instantaneously and mapping and video conferencing. Imagine all that, and this for its time was more impressive than all the things that we have today. Incredible, right? So let's talk about Let's watch the video, shall let's, let's watch it. Alan Kay, uh, introducing Sketchpad. So, invention of computer graphics. Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad, probably the most significant single thesis ever done. Remarkable program in many ways, even today, as we'll see by looking at this tape. This tape is from the very first movie. very first movie of uh, Sketchpad taken in the summer of 1962. So this is 25 years old. Rubber bands you're familiar with, but look at what he's doing. He's pointing at the edges and saying, I want them to be all mutually perpendicular, and Sketchpad just figured out how to do that. Sketchpad is the first system to ever have a window. He's actually drawing on a virtual sheet of paper about a third of a mile on a side. Again, to get something he wants, he simply sketches it in roughly and then gives rules like be parallel and perpendicular, and Sketchpad figures out and solves the problem. Here the rule is collinearity, so that the dashes lie directly over the guidelines below. And Sketchpad was able to solve very complicated problems in real time uh, involving uh, both linear and nonlinear uh, systems of constraints. So it was the first non-procedural programming system and considerably more powerful than the spreadsheets of today. So he's made a hole in the flange, continuously zooms back. Now he wants to make a rivet, and again we see why it's called Sketchpad. He just draws a rough shape, uses the center of the crossbar there, as the center of the arc, and then points to the edges and says, I want these to be mutually perpendicular again. Solving that forces the crossbar to change, which forces the arc to change, which gives you a perfectly symmetrical rivet. And he shows that how, no matter how you distort it, when he turns the problem solver on, it will come up with a symmetrical solution. 
And he could have made it more complicated. He could have constrained the side lengths to be ratios of each other or tied to some other drawing in the, uh, in the environment. Now, another important idea seen here for practically the first time is that of master drawings and instances. He was working on a master drawing, and what he has here now is an instance of that. The instance can be rotated and scaled in position, so he's going to insert the rivet in the hole. By the way, the sketch pad was the first system in which it was definitely uh, discovered that the light pen is a very bad input device. So the blood runs out of your hand in about 20 seconds and leaves it numb. And in spite of that, it's been reinvented at least 90 times in the last uh, 25 years. Here's another instance of the rivet, another one. Now, the display is jumping around like that because this, they didn't even really have computer displays back then. The TX2 is putting up every uh, dot by brute force. He didn't like the cross pieces, so he goes to the master drawing, makes them transparent. Lo and behold, we see dynamically that the rivets, the instance rivets, have felt that change. So Sketchpad is also the first object-oriented software system. I once asked Ivan Sutherland, how could you possibly have done the first interactive graphics program, the first non-procedural programming language, the first uh, object-oriented software system all in one year? He said, well, I didn't know it was hard. There's nothing like this before. And here he's showing that every instance that you make of something, uh, every master can create instances. So he's making a bunch of copies of the hole in the, in the flange. Now, I'd like to tell you where you could go to buy a system as good as Sketchpad, but I don't know where, because there isn't anything like it even on the market today 25 years later. It was a one-of-a-kind thing. It ran on a machine much larger than the studio that I'm recording the talk on. In fact, it was the last computer large enough to have its own roof in the United States. That was an impressive demo. I um, hope you appreciated how, how monumental that was for its time. I mean, people were typing and writing very, very basic things, and this thing was so beyond graphically and intuitively and in terms of the first non-procedural language. It really did blow open the doors of what one could do. And so, he, he has deserved all the honors that he's received, this is Ivan Sutherland. So now what I want to do is show you a demo of the ability to do object-oriented programming in BYOB. Before I do that and show you the demo, let me show you what the code's going to look like. <coughs> On the left, you have a new counter that is set up like a factory. Okay? All it is is a procedure with no arguments. Right? It is a, sorry, a function of no arguments because it returns a value. So this function takes no inputs, and what it's going to do is return an object. Sets a script variable count, sets the count to be zero, and then reports. You'll, you'll see how we do that, what that, the script means. We'll see that much, much later. But it reports kind of a nugget. So under this thing called the script, in which, what does it do? Changes count by one and reports count. So it reports that it returns an actual function. Okay, so now watch this. I make two separate counters. So set counter one to be new counter, and that returns, that returns now a new nugget, a new instance called counter one, and another one called counter two. And they're different. Why are they different? Because I'm going to say, say, when I say say, that's kind of a, a, what we've done here is um, this say is the built-in thing for BYB to, to announce something right there. Um, call counter one for two seconds. So it, call, it does that, it calls counter one, which means it calls that script. What does the script do? It changes count by one and reports the count. So counter one, like here's my two counters, right? One and two. Counter one goes from zero, they're both set to zero, to bling, one, and returns that. Retur see that in, there's an inner report in the script, and then it returns the one. And so our BYOB Alonzo uh, sprite says bing, one. And then it says call counter one again. Bloop, and now counter one is two, reports two, and it says two. Say call counter one again. Bling, does it again, it says three. Now, think call counter two. This guy was zero. 
It goes in here, calls the script, it was zero, makes it one, and thinks that, and the output is a thought bubble that says one. These are two different numbers, and it's clear from the, what's saying and thinking. Think, call counter two again, blink, this is two, now this is two. These are two separate instances of this counter class, if that makes sense. Three and a two. And now say, call counter one again, and blink, it says four, and there's your four. Okay? There's also the ability to, in sprites, this is the built-in part of BYOB. That's, this is like making our own oop thing, oop kind of world with over here. We don't, we're not going to have you do this. It's just a demo of that. But in fact, you can do the thing that's on the bottom right, which is run dance of girl, where girl is another sprite. And you can send a message to the sprite saying, hey, other sprite, do something. You knew you could do that already with something called broadcast. You've seen that already where you can broadcast down and any sprite listening will listen to that message and do it if it's, if it's receiving that. This is an explicit way, not to say broadcast, like this is the Rita Moreno Saturday Night, Saturday Night. Rita Moreno Electric Company, she used to say, hey, you guys, and everyone would listen. Everybody who's listening to that like, wakes up and does something. That's the broadcast model, the Rita Moreno model. This is explicitly saying, no, you, Mr. Sprite, Miss Sprite, over there, do that particular dance, okay? So let's go and see that in BYOB. So let's go over here and move this and do the flangle and a flangle here. And go here and go to code, BYOB, oop. And I double click this guy, and there is my oop example. So now, here is uh, the example. I'm going to say full screen this, and I will say run. Now what's going to happen? Oop in BYOB? Sure. First, I'll make two counters and say the values of one and think the values of the other. One, two, three. Then think one, think two, and say four. Okay? So that code you just, oh, and look, she's doing a dance. She's doing a dance. Isn't that cute? Okay. So look, there's the code I just showed you. Run, dance of girl. And over here, girl, what does girl have? Look, there's no script. How do I know that? Well, I made a custom block, and it's over here in, I think it's in variables, I think. I'm going to scroll down, and there's dance. And when I go to open dance, I say edit, and I'll see that this is a little dance that the girl knows how to do. You know, set delay, set the world amount, clear graphics effect, change the world effect by world amount, wait, change it by something, and it does this little whirly, whirly dance. But you realize this message was sent from another sprite. So this is message passing in the OOP model. So in some sense, BYOB has... I'll go back here. BYOB has native oopiness in that it has sprites and you can send messages from sprites to sprites. So rather than kind of faking it with the counter thing, which is really kind of an academic exercise, we're showing you that really built into BYOB is this idea of object-oriented programming, at least in the message passing way. What we haven't shown you is that you can actually in BYOB make the exact same thing you saw on Sketchpad the prototyping model where you have one master sprite in this case and you make a clone of it and this clone then follows over this master does if the master changes a value this sprite will change it also we have prototyping based object orientation just like you saw in sketchpad and there are actually two different flavors of object orientation one is the um, class factory instance model and one is the prototyping model that you saw in sketchpad we in BYOB do the prototyping model. So that's kind of cool, and you can explore that. I believe you can even do it here. Let's go to the sprite, pull the mouse, and uh-oh, uh-oh, what does that word say? Oh, what did he just say? Clone. You can make a clone of a sprite and do some really powerful things. Um, there are going to be some tutorials. If you, this is not going to be officially part of the class. That's something we're still working on on the inside, inner side, but stuff works, and you can play with it. There's some great demos that show these answering around all clones of each other. It's really very cool. Okay. So that's the BYOB demo for that one, and we'll jump back into here. So uh, that's open BYOB. The fourth programming paradigm with uh, about 10 minutes to go is declarative. And this is the fourth idea and really the most different than the other ones. Declarative programming is <clears throat> all the other paradigms. You basically had to tell the computer what to do at every stage. Take this data, pass it to this, compute that, compute that. Declarative programming is like magic. 
you tell the system some rules, and then you can ask the system questions about the rules you've already taught it, if that makes sense. It's like the Watson, which we saw, which we'll see in the AI section, this IBM Watson AI system where you teach it all these rules, and then you ask it a query. Who was the 14th president? And it just knows it. I didn't, have to, I didn't actually tell it how to search it. It just did it. And I just was asking queries of it. Similar way. So you tell it what you want, not how to do it. That's really important. That's what's different. Imperative is mostly you're spent working on the how. And the what is kind of subordinate. In this case, the what is forefront. And the how is you don't care. It's magic. It's really cool. It's done by somebody else. It's done by the library. So there's some subcategories of this called constraint. The same thing you just saw on Sketchpad with, in which you said, make these things right angles, and just, it just did it. That was, in some sense, a declarative expression. You said, I want to make these, here's some ge geometrical lines, and have some property, like make them all right angles, and it just worked. It didn't say, you know, take the biggest one and subtract it. Did it, did it. No, it just did it. So he was already implementing a declarative interface in his wonderful Sketchpad system. An example is like Prolog. So, let me go to the next one, which is this delightful example, which has a demo with it. Okay, so here is a logic puzzle, and we'll see if we can use declarative programming to solve it, in which we just put the facts in and don't tell it how to solve it, but it'll just do it magically. That's what's so cool about declarative programming. Five schoolgirls, I usually don't read the slides, but I'll read it for this case, sat for an examination. Their parents, so they thought, showed an undue degree of interest in the result. They therefore agreed that in writing home about the examination, each girl should make one true statement and one false statement. We make two statements, and each of these five girls make two statements, one true and one false. The following are the relevant passages from their letters. Betty said, Kitty was second, I was third. Ethel said I was on top, Joan was second. Joan said I was third, Ethel was last, Kitty said, etc. Okay? Each one of these, there's a true statement and a false statement. And you have to kind of figure out the path of what are the possible combinations are that provide one unique answer? I'm not telling it how to do it. I'm just asking it. So let's go try it. Let's there's our little sprite. There's our Berkeley picture. And uh, let's now hear and say go. Hi, I'm a declarative permutation solver. I can solve any problem of relative position. Type 1 for a simple example or 2 for a more complicated example. So... Uh, Let's do it, see what one was. One says, solve this simple problem. What is the simple problem? It is here. Let's, let's look here. Here's the, here's the expressions. B is 1 or B is 2 and false or C is 1. So what's the value of B, A, B, and C to be mapped to the numbers 1, 2, and 3? You see? So that this is true. Can A be 1, B be 2, C be 3? Is that true here? And, so and to be true, both the pieces of the and have to be true. Remember that we said that last time? So, or either one of them can be true, and that returns a true statement. So is false true? No. So it means this has to be true. Therefore, C has to be 1. Okay? How about this case? If C is 1, then it's B and uh, a being either 2 or 3, right? And this one says B is 1 or B is 2. And therefore we know B is 2, C is 1, and the A, which isn't even here, has to be the 3. Get it? C, 1, B, 2, A, 3. Okay? Let's try it. So that's how I encoded that problem. Okay? So here's my thing, and now I'll type 1. Let's see if that works. A, 3, B, 2, C, 1. It figured it out just as we figured it out in real time. I've also encoded... The girls' problem. So let's go try that. The school girls' problem. Let's try that one. And two. We're going to wait half a second. And let's see what happens. Let's see if it can solve our problem. I didn't tell... Oh, look at that. Betty is three. Ethel's five. Joan is two. Kitty is one. Mary is four. How did I do that? What was the school girls' problem? Edit. And you'll see it's a little bit big, but it's essentially the same rules I said. What was... <clears throat> What did the first student say? The first student said, Kitty is 2. Let's see. I'll show you this one. Remember this one? Let's see. it. Kitty was second. Betty, I, was third. Okay? So, look at this. Kitty was second. Betty was third. This part says not 
equal. And what that means is one answer is going to be true. One answer is going to be false. So it's either false true or true false. So they're not equal. If they were equal, it would be true true, which isn't allowed because they're not saying two true statements, or false false, which isn't allowed because they're not making two false statements. They're making exactly one true, one false. So a kind of clever way of doing it is saying not equal. Get it? False is not equal to true. That's the only way to make it happen. I just essentially encoded that in the system. I never told how to solve it. It just works. Magic. Okay? That code is available for you to peruse to see how I did that. Pretty cool stuff. Ways to remember. Uh, functional is a composition. Evaluate expressions. Keep going. You compose these pipes together. Object-oriented is send messages between these instances. Imperative is do this, do this, do this, like a recipe. And declarative is the rule-based magical thing that just kind of works, OK? So each paradigm has its unique benefits. That's really important. There is no winning best paradigm. They're all equally powerful, and they each have their benefits. There are times when you want to be in a functional world, or you want to be in a parative world, or you want to be in a declarative world, or you want to be in an oop world. And there's each times when you have this. That's why there are languages that represent each of those corners. Most languages can be them all, can be all of them. So uh, Scratch and BYB can be all of them, equally powerful.